the libration points of the geostationary orbit are the points that when a satellite that's in the geostationary orbit no longer has station keeping capability, it drifts to the libation, libration points. And there are two of them. So if you have a satellite out there and, you, and it's supposed to be in this box, right? To keep it out there. If you lose the propulsion on it, it drifts to two different points. They're called libration points. And what it looks like is this. Did they talk about the oblateness of the Earth? Did, you, did anybody talk about that to you? The oblateness of the Earth? No! How can you talk about orbits without that? Did anybody talk to you about sun synchronous orbits? Okay, what is a, I'm sorry, I got a sore in my mouth. What is a sun synchronous orbit? An orbit that consistently stays in between the sun and the earth. Does the orbit plane rotate? Okay, here's Here's the sun, here's your satellite, and it has some plane like that. So here's the sun, and say this is the equinox, and down here there's another equinox, right? When are these equinoxes? What does it mean when we have an equinox? When reaches any point between um, the solstices. Right. It's, it's when the plane, when the geographic plane of the Earth is pointing right at the sun, right? So the amount of daylight that you have and the amount of nighttime that you have is equal. That's what equa means, equinox. There's a spring equinox and a fall equinox, right? Okay. And so there's, the, it, it, the Earth is rotating around the sun in this orbit, right? <clears throat> you have a plane that your satellite is rotating around the Earth, right? What happens to that plane during a sun synchronous orbit? There's something very special happens to it. It what? The angle with respect to the sun stays the same. Okay? Let's see if I can get this right. The angle with respect to the sun stays the same. So what that means is that the plane of the orbit has to rotate as it goes around the sun 360 degrees, right? And what good is that? It what? It, it orbits at the same time over a position on the Earth, right? What, what good is that? certain area you can keep track of that that way or you can do I think it's like satellite for the TV for the TV so mm -hmm. probably more the imaging satellites yeah. you're more interested in in those things uh, looking at something and seeing how it changes over time the best way to do it is observe it at the same time every day right mm -hmm. okay the question now is why does that why does that orbit change we, we talk you 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 talked about inclination of an orbit right what's the inclination of an orbit the what the inclination of the orbit is this angle right here here's the equator here's the north pole and here's the south pole 
the inclination of the orbit is this angle between the equator and the plane of the orbit. Now, you can have a plane of the orbit here, so I is less than 90 degrees, right? That's from here up to here. But you can also have something here where I is greater than 90 degrees, right? What is the orbit plane over here? There are um, two terms for that. There is prograde and there is retrograde. Which is prograde and which is retrograde? Retro is over here, and this is the prograde. When the orbit plane is over here, there is an effect of this bump on the Earth called the oblateness of the Earth, right? The, 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 it's larger around the equator than it is around the poles. So it's kind of like you took this guy and you put your foot on it and pushed it down and it pushed out there. What's the effect of that? We have more mass here than we do up here. There's more gravitational pull here because there's more mass. What happens to the orbit here in the prograde? If you look at it from the top, like this, and you have uh, an orbit that's, that's like this, this is the North Pole, what happens to that orbit plane? Does it stay in the same place all the time? Are orbits not perturbed? Or they just stay there and nothing happens to them? They're, they're perturbed. Somebody makes them mad, right? Isn't that what perturbed means? Are you perturbed if I kick you on the shins? <laughs> what it means is that there are disturbances in the orbit. What are the things that cause disturbance in the orbit? What's out there that's happening? The drag the There's drag from the atmosphere. There's solar wind. What? Yeah, it can knock it out of the orbit, right? What about the effect of the, um, the gravitational force of the moon? Yeah, yeah. What about the effect of the gravitational pull of the sun? It's pulling on it, right? Everybody's pulling each way on it. But it turns out that that bump on the Earth has a very significant effect on the plane of the orbit. When it's in a prograde orbit, the, the, it turns out that the oblateness of the Earth causes the plane of the orbit to shift clockwise. Okay? It causes it to shift. If you, if you looked at it as going around the sun, that thing would rotate clockwise around the Earth in a, in a prograde orbit. In a retrograde orbit, it does counterclockwise. And you're using that because if you look at this way, which way is this turning? It's turning counterclockwise, right? And so how much do I want the orbit plane to change between here and here? 90 degrees. What's doing it is when you're in this retrograde orbit, it, tur it, it switches from clockwise to counterclockwise. Because of the rotation of the Earth, because of the way that bulge is sticking out there, it rotates counterclockwise. 
What would you expect it to do if it were exactly 90 degrees? If I have a place where I go between counterclockwise and clockwise, what happens at 90 degrees? It what? Yeah, it doesn't rotate, right? That may not be a good thing. We like this, this sun synchronous, right? Sun sync. What does synchronous mean? It's lockstep with it, right? There's some sort of motion that's lockstep. If I say your clock is synchronized right, what does it mean? It's hopefully the right time if the other clock is, right? Okay. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. Now, so this is really important. It turns out that due to the oblateness of the Earth, there's another orbit. And this orbit looks, has a plane that looks something like this. This is the North Pole. And it goes way up high here and way low there. And it's over the northern equator. What kind of orbit is that called? That's the Russian one. What's it called? Molnaya. Why do the Russians like that? Not necessarily. It's a good look at Russia is what they want. They want to have a satellite for communication purposes there. If you get up above a certain point, you cannot see a geostationary satellite. Because what you've got is this. Here's the Earth. Okay, and here's a ge geostationary satellite out there. Can that see the North Pole? No, because what happens is it just skims like this. Whoop, not too good a line like that. But it turns out that it's somewhere around 80 degrees or a little more that you cannot see a geostationary satellite. There's a lot of Russia that's above that. So they want TV too. All right? How do they get a satellite to give them 24-hour TV? They can't use the low Earth orbit, right? What happens in low Earth orbit? Right around, very fast, right? Okay. So they have this orbit here. I think it's somewhere around 69 degrees inclination that comes around here. And how fast is it going here? How fast is it going up here? So what happens as this thing goes up? How much time does it spend up here compared to the time down here? So what they do is they have antennas here like this that says when this guy comes up, I'm going to track him and I'm going to follow him all the way up to here and all the way back down to here. I might get maybe 20 hours connected to him. If I had this little guy running around here, how much time would I have connected to him? 15 minutes. When, uh, when our pocket cubes come over, you're going to see him at max for 15 minutes. Would you like to watch television for 15 minutes and then lose it for 24 hours? That wouldn't keep your attention, would it? You'd be calling the TV station, wouldn't you? But the Russians do this. Now, what do they do when this one goes around behind? Because you can't see it. They what? That's right. About the time this one comes down here, they have a second one that's going like that. So they always have one up there. That's pretty clever, right? But let me ask you this. Why doesn't, because the Earth makes these things move around like that, why doesn't this plane rotate and go wow? Why? No, it turns out they are. But it turns out that that's a, that's a, they've 
calculated it, and due to the gravitational force of the Earth, that is a stable orbit up there. It's one of the stable orbits. You can find another stable orbit down here. But if you have anything else in between that's like this, that point wrote, can rotate around due to the blatantness of the Earth and due to the you know, perturbations of all these other things. Okay. Everybody got that? This is really the crux of the orbits. You got to understand that. You got to understand what retrograde is, prograde is, what is the effect on that? What is the sun synchronous? What makes it sun synchronous? Now, if you look up sun synchronous and say you're an altitude of 700 kilometers, it's going to give you an inclination. What is that inclination going to be? Is it going to be less than 90 degrees or more than 90 degrees? It's going to be more. But it turns out for every altitude, and they're talking about relatively low Earth orbits, for every altitude there is an inclination that makes it sun synchronous. Now, it turns out the higher the altitude here, the higher the altitude, the more the inclination. Why would that be? If I have a satellite right here, I may only, uh, uh, I may only have to have an inclination that far. But if I have a satellite here, I may have to go a lot farther. It's what? It's essentially true. Is there more gravitational force here or here? The closer. So this has more force to rotate the orbit if it's a low altitude than if it's a high altitude. If I cre increase the altitude, the torque on the plane increases as I increase the inclination. So I have to increase the inclination to overcome less uh, gravitational force at that point. And the gravitational force due to this is what's causing the plane of that to rotate. Okay, now, is the eclipse of the Earth of interest to us? Is the eclipse of an orbit of interest to us? Why? What do you generate power for your satellite? Do you generate power for solar panels in the eclipse of the Earth? No. You want to generate a lot of power as much as you can, right? So you better know what orbit it's going in and what eclipse it's going in. What if I have an orbit that looks like this? <coughs> Here's the sun out here. Like this. Here's the Earth. Let's just say here's the equator. And I have an orbit that's going around here like this. Whoop, it's supposed to be circular. It's going around in a circular orbit. Where is the eclipse of the Earth? It's here, right? Isn't this the eclipse? So the satellite comes orbiting around, out in the sunlight, bing, into the orbit. How long does it stay in the orbit? If this were an altitude here of 500 kilometers, can you tell me how long that would be in the orbit, or in the eclipse? Huh? How long? Come on. Tell me. Well, look at this. How long does it take it to go around? How much? If it's 500 kilometers high, what is the orbit period? What is the period how can I calculate the period? 
What? Okay, so what you're saying is what is the velocity? So isn't the period the distance over the velocity? What will that give me? Distance is in meters, and this is meters per second, right? So what do I end up with? I end up with seconds, which is what? Time? How are you, how are you going to calculate that? Can you calculate the distance? Right, that's what? Of the circle. What's the, what's the distance around a circle called? Circumference, right? You find the circumference by knowing what? what the radius is. So this distance is equal to um, 2 pi r, isn't it? 2 pi r? Okay, if we know r, we know the distance. How do we calculate the velocity? Divide what? Isn't there a formula to calculate the velocity of an orbit? Spacecraft velocity. Square uh, two uh, times the quantity of um, it's got the, the standard gravimetrical standard gravimetrical parameter and then over the distance between the orbiting body and the center of the central body. So it's essentially something over, uh, let's just call it uh, R plus A, which is the altitude, right? But it's broken down. It's, it's a given number, right? It's, yeah. It's like, there's another one in there too. It's like U over R plus, like, an, like a weird fucking E. Uh, da, 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 da. I think, I think uh, right. This is the one Doc gave us here. Yeah, I think after that there should be... He didn't give you the one, did he? Well, look it up. How do you look it up? Google. Okay, good old Google. What you're going to find is you're going to find the velocity. Uh, and, and tell me this. I got the Earth here, and I've got some altitude. And we assume it's a circular orbit. What's the velocity at that altitude? What's the velocity? Let's say this is 500 kilometers. Is it a unique number? What is it if I go to 600? What is it if I go to 700? What happens to the velocity? Does it decrease or increase? What happens as you to the uh, what's holding it in the orbit? Gravity, right? As you get farther away from the Earth, the gravity is less. So in order to maintain that balance. If the gravity goes down, what must the velocity do? Go down. So the larger the orbit, the less the velocity. All right? Does that make sense? All right? You believe me? Okay. I got land in Idaho with an ocean front. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, that's true. For every circular orbit, the altitude, there is a given velocity for that altitude. Okay, what, what happens if I got an orbit around here, it's a circular orbit, what happens up here 
this guy's going this way. What happens if I give, this is a, got a little rocket nozzle on it, and I say, give it a shot. What's that going to do to it? It's going to increase the velocity, okay? So here I'm going to increase the velocity, and what's that going to do to the orbit? It makes it what? It's going to make it elliptical, right? And when you start making it elliptical, it doesn't have the same velocity all around, does it? Okay. Now what happens if I'm here, is the velocity here now, after I kick this thing without firing it again, what is the velocity here compared to the velocity here? This is greater than this here. What happens if I give it a kick here and increase the velocity? Would you make it back into a circular orbit? You're right. You're right. It's going back into a circular orbit. Huh? Well, yeah, what you're going to do is you're going to do this, right? You're going to get into a higher altitude. That's how you change. That, it's, it's interesting. They talk about how you rendezvous in orbit. How does two spacecraft rendezvous in orbit? How, do, how, does the, how did the shuttle rendezvous with the space station? It had to get this orbit the same. But let's say, for example, that here is the space station and here is the shuttle, okay? How does the shuttle catch up with the space station? What happens if it just puts on some thrust there? It's going to go into an elliptical orbit, right? Does that necessarily mean it's going to catch up with them? The way he can catch up with him, what if he brings his orbit down to here? What about his velocity? It'll do what? Increase or decrease? It'll increase, and so... What must he do about right here? He must have to get up into the orbit here with, with this thing. So in order to catch up, he has to go to a smaller orbit. Doesn't seem intuitive, does it? Well, you just you go down to the, the orbit and he's still up there and what you're doing is waiting till you catch up with him and then what you want to do is go into the higher orbit and hopefully you get up close to him. Well I'm yeah, we are going this direction. What? Oh, it's, yeah. They spend a lot of years learning to do that. Why do they, like, why would you the point in there? What? Why would they do it? They wanted a rendezvous. Okay. I didn't know. Yeah. How do you get to the station? you gotta get, you got to get up there, right? So how do you get to the station? Okay. Well, let me go back here once more because it's important. One of the things that we're going to get into here is uh, power systems, okay? Uh, and I'll show you that, but we need to know what the eclipse is. If I have uh, the sun out here and I have an eclipse of the earth like that and the satellite goes around like this, can I find the time that it goes there and the time that it goes there and if I know the velocity do I know the distance? I calculate the period by what? Period is calculated by the circumference divided by the velocity, right? Does that make sense? Okay, there's a circumference on that orbit, right? This tells me what the total period is. How do I find out the time that it goes from there to there? What do I know? 
well, I know what the radius of the Earth is, right? And I know what this distance is from here to here, so I know what that is, right? Okay, I know if I know that, then what I can do is, if I know this, and I know this distance, let's see what it is. I know this arm, and I want to calculate that angle. Right? How do I do it? You're trying to find the arc length. I'm trying, yeah, I'm trying to find the arc length, but the way I can do it, if I know this angle, then I know the one down here is the same, right? Yeah. So then if I know this and I know this, don't I know that? If I know that, I can tell you what percentage of, of this time here is spent in the eclipse. Just a little old geometry problem. Is it sine of theta? Well, let's let's call let's call this theta, okay? What is what is this as far as the uh, that's a hypotenuse? So that's equal to the radius of the Earth plus the altitude, right? And I know this is a right angle, okay? So. I know, do I know this side? Yeah, that's the radius. So it's the, it's the arc cosine, right? This is, this is the, this is the cosine over here, right? That's the sine. So it's the, the arc cosine of that, right? The arc cosine of theta, or theta equals, theta equals the arc cosine of that. Theta out here equals the arc cosine of r over that. Do I have enough information to tell me what the time that I have in the eclipse? And that only occurs that only occurs when this plane of the Earth and the Sun is out there. And it turns out that that is the maximum eclipse that you get. Because the eclipse is like this, right? And it's, oh, when it comes over here, it's in the eclipse all the way around. What happens if my plane is like this? It's not in there all the time, right? What happens if my plane is like this? Boy, this is a tough class. Everybody's going to sleep. What do I do? <laughs> Every I thought you'd like to get in some mathematics here. You know, we've been waving our hands before. Now we're getting into some mathematics. Look at this. What happens if the sun is here and the plane of the orbit is there? It what? No eclipse. It's on the terminator. What's the terminator? Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> the terminator. It's on the terminator. We don't go in to the eclipse at all. Is that different than when I'm 90 degrees from there? I, it turns out I get the maximum eclipse. In the Leo orbits from 300 to 800, it turns out that's about 36% of the time. So if you get something that's like this, and this is this one is the one that you start here and you go around with the sun here like this. Let me let me erase this. You go around with the sun and the plane of the orbit directly looks at the sun. That gives you the maximum eclipse. Okay, here's the Earth, here's the orbit, here's the eclipse. 
that's going to give you the maximum eclipse. Okay, here's the sun. When do I have to launch the rocket to do that? If the sun, if the right here on the earth, and the sun is directly for us to the south, how do I, what time is it when the sun is directly south of us? Noon. So this is either at noon, or midnight. It's called a noon midnight launch. What would it be, here's the eclipse, here's my orbit, when would I launch when the sun is here and I'm here? Dawn dusk, that's right. Dawn dusk. Which orbit would you rather have? And for what reason? During the dawn dusk, you only ever get partial sun, which you have all the time, right? Yeah. But it has to do with the way that the solar panels are pointed to say how efficient or how much sun they're getting. Yeah. So it, you have to run the numbers and see what if you could point when you're in the sun you could point your solar array directly at the sun all the time the dusk dawn would give you more right is there any a disadvantage to that of being out in the sun all the time what yeah what else No. Sweat, sweat, sweat. Yeah. <laughs> this mime. <laughs> you remember that? You got to remember that. Out in the sun all the time. Sweat, sweat, sweat. Okay. Are you going to wear a black shirt or a white shirt? Why? How do you know? How do you know that it's not cold enough out there that you should wear your black shirt? That's right, but how do you know what the temperature on your spacecraft is? It, maybe it's really, really cold out there. Even Have you ever been outside when the sun's shining and it's really, really cold? Yeah, like right now. Okay. All right. A little review of orbits. Okay. Know what the formula is to calculate the velocity of a satellite in a circular orbit. Okay. Know what a Molniya orbit is. Know what a Leo orbit is. Well, no, you can look it up. Uh, how about uh, what's a geostationary orbit? Okay. What's a half sync orbit? What satellites do you put at half sync? GPS. GPS is half sync. If the radius of a full, of a full geostationary orbit is 24,000 miles, what's the radius of a half sink? 1,200, yeah, okay. What's the orbit period of a half sink? Not necessarily, look out, look out. How do you find out? Get that velocity formula. If you know the radius and you know the velocity formula, you got it made, okay? Remember what is a noon midnight orbit, what is a dawn dusk orbit, and what's the difference in the eclipse on them? We're going to have to build satellites that have these kind of orbits, and we have to know how big to build the solar panels to supply the power that it needs. Do I need bigger solar panels for a noon midnight orbit than I do a dawn dusk orbit? You need a bigger one for dawn dusk. 
Dawn dusk? What's the e eclipse time on a dawn dusk? None. So which has the bigger solar panels? Noon midnight, because it's got an eclipse on it, right? Potential maximum eclipse on a LEO satellite is roughly 36%. When you go for an interview to get that 125K a year job, you need to really was, was, woo, babble your boss. <laughs> babble your boss. I think that's right. Okay. Retrograde, prograde. Oblateness. Perturbation. Look over your notes. Look over your notes. You got to know those things. Because why? Why should you know those things? You're a satellite designer, right? Why should you know those things? You, you bet. You, if you don't take that into account, what's going to happen to your satellite? You know? Your customer doesn't like it. You didn't know about orbits? You didn't know that you didn't design your solar panels? Is your customer going to know? You go in and you show him, oh, I got, I got three meters of solar panels here, and it'll generate mm, watts. Mm, watts, okay. But you put you in an orbit where you go into the eclipse and it only generates mm, watts, not mm, okay. <laughs> so you got to know the difference between mm, mm, mm. All right. We're going to go into power systems, and that's one of the things in power systems is we have to know the orbits, and we have to know which way your solar panels are pointed, and we have to know what the temperature of your solar panels are, and we have to know what the effect of the radiation is on them, and we have to know a lot of things, but that's, that's what we're here for, right? We're not going to let you out of here without telling you all those things. All you have to do is remember them. Right? <laughs> okay. What are the subsystems in a spacecraft? Some guy named Kevin Brown come talk to you. Can you name me some of the subsystems of a spacecraft? What is the minimum that you need? You remember, Chris? Name me one. Power, okay, that's a subsystem. Gabby? How do you communicate? Radio. Radio. <coughs> okay, that's what? That's a process. That's a processor, right? Uh, there's what about how I control the way it's oriented? What? Attitude control. Attitude control system. What about if I wanted to move? How do I move? With what? Propulsion system, right? Now you remember that, right? Okay, how do I hold all these things together? Yeah, structure, right? Do I worry about temperature? Why? I don't want to fry it. I don't want to freeze it. What happens to the solar panels when they get hot? Did he say? They degrade. What happens to the battery when it gets cold? It degrades. Now, how do you know that? Have you experienced that with your car? Does your car start easier in the winter than it does in the summer? What's the thing that makes it harder to start in the winter? Like the, cold. the cold, but what's the cold doing? What does it affect in your car? Something changed in your car, right? From when it was hot to cold. What changed? 
Well, one thing, what the oil do? What happened to the viscosity? Oh, don't do that. Oh my gosh, that's, that's going to cost me. What did what did the uh, what happens to the oil? The viscosity? Does that make it easier to start or harder? Okay, but even that, the battery doesn't work quite as well in the cold, right? So there's two effects there. So, okay. Let's see. We got about 15 minutes. Let me see if I can. Okay, I got that on. I got this on. All right. Oh, let's go through these real quick. First of all, you got a sheet that looks like this. I want everybody in here today, before you leave, to just put your name on it, but check off everything that you've got done. I know you've handed in this before, but I just need kind of a log. Are you up through chapter 7 and got it done? Are you up through chapter 8? You don't need to go get anything. Uh, just make sure you have the sheet. I want it turned in today. The lab on Friday is to start now with your cricket sat transmitting and we're going to get a receiver chip that will put on your basic stamp so now you can start transmitting information from something that's remote okay so that's what we're going to do on friday uh, also tomorrow night here mr club president uh we're going to have a think tank session and what is a think tank session Think tank session is what? Cost me 10 bucks today, man. Who's keeping track of this? Uh, Eric's not here now, and he was the one that was keeping track of it. Oh, you're the tracker, huh? Okay. What is the think tank session? Collaborating ideas. Collaborating ideas, that's right. What we want you to come is come, and you can either do two things. I have this idea for something that's really cool that if I could make it, it'd make me a millionaire. Or I want to have something that does this. I want to tell you something. Did I tell you about I want to have something that's on the side of my car that the new cars have got that tells you when somebody's in your blind spot? Did I tell you I want one? I want you to make me one. Okay? It's really easy. Because you know why? I almost killed a lady on the trip. I was driving along, watching my rear view mirror, and I looked back, and I didn't see anything for quite a ways, and I drove on a little bit more. There's a truck in front of me. I went to pull out, and this lady was right by me. I could not see her. She was in my blind spot. She went off the road, down into the dirt, big cloud of dirt, come back up out of the dirt, across the freeway, sideways, with her car, off the other side and down, and she stopped. If there'd have been any difference at the side of the road, if there would have been a steep bank, or there would have been a big bank, she would have wrecked there. When she come back across the road, if there'd been anybody behind her, they would have hit her. So we stopped and backed up, and that poor lady was sitting in her car, hanging on to the steering wheel, just shaking and crying. It was so close to being a disastrous accident. And if I had that blind spot indicator, I would have not done that. Have you ever done that with a car? I can't believe anybody has ever driven that hasn't done that. You don't see the car and you start to pull out and they honk, right? Have you done that? That's, that's a terrible, terrible, scary feeling. We can make a device that tells you there's a car there. That little acoustic sensor we got, you could hook that to your basic stamp and you could put it in a little box on the back fender of your car and you could put a red light on it and a green light on it. Before you turn, you could look in your rear view mirror, look at that box and see a red light or a green light. And that's all you'd have to do. It's just a box that you could stick on your fender. It's so simple to make. Why haven't you made one? 
Why haven't you made one? I want to go buy one. Right? Why haven't you made one? It's so simple. Do you think other people would want one? What if it cost $25 a piece? Would you buy one? What if it cost $50 a piece? Would you buy one? What if it cost 100 If you had $100, you'd buy it. Would you buy 100 for each side, or would you want to buy it for $25 each side? Okay. What if you could make it for $5 and sell it to people? How many people do you think would buy it? Would everybody buy one at $5? How many lives are you saving? Wouldn't you want to do that? You don't want to sell it for 25 because the more you charge, what happens to the number you sell? Goes down. So you want that kind of sweet spot. Do you want to give it to them? No. Because when you give them to them, it's free. What do they think about free things? They, they don't like it. They don't like People actually don't like free things. They would rather pay something for it than it has some value. So why doesn't this class take on the project of building those things? Starting a business for it. Huh? Is that a final project? Yeah. Yeah, who wants to do it? Okay, look at that. Look at that. Look at those hands. Now, you've got to go all the way through of developing it, and you've got to develop a package for it, and you've got to do the marketing on it. So it isn't just the technical end of it. There's more things. But wouldn't that be cool if that was a product that started a business out of this school from this class? Okay, come tomorrow night. Let's talk about it. Now, I need something else. You know, I've got a whole list of things. I happen to have some chickens, right? <laughs> and those chickens are out in a little coop in a shed at our house in a neighborhood where we're not supposed to have chickens. <laughs> and we want, I want to know if it gets too cold out there. Do you know anything that can measure temperature? Our cricket sat. We can put a transmitter on the cricket sat that when it gets too cold, it activates the transmitter, and I can put a receiver next week or this week. We're going to put a receiver on the basic stamp, so I could put a cricket sat out there with a transmitter on, and I could put a receiver on a basic stamp, and I could say when it's too low, sound this alarm. So I could tell when it gets too cold for my chickens. No, they're not my chickens. They're somebody else's. Yeah, I know you would. Did you like to give them to a heater or something? We have a heater out there with them. Uh, well, yeah. Could, like, pull the trigger of the heater when it got too cold, like, to a certain Yeah, we could turn it on or turn it off so we could keep a uniform temperature. And it's scary, you know. You, you have a chicken and we have all this, all of this stuff. Uh, it's uh, like wood chips and stuff that's in there. It looks like it's really a fire hazard. And so you have this heat lamp on out there. And it's kind of scary, you know. So, But I, we leave it on. But wouldn't you like to know, what if somebody, before you went to bed, we have the cord running all the way from a shed into the house. What if some, before somebody went to bed, they tripped over the cord and pulled it out? No chicky heat. <laughs> So think about things like that. We, you, have the capability now with this microprocessor. You can measure temperature. You can put things on it to measure distance. Start thinking about all the things you can make. You go down to the uh, auto parts store. Maybe they have a thing I can put on the fender. But maybe you could make something that's better, right? Anybody else got something you want? What do you said? Oh, I wish somebody'd make that. If they did, I would buy it. You don't ever have anything like that. How about you, Holly? You don't have anything like you know. I'm always going around wishing for something else. How would you like to walk into the grocery store with your with this 
And when you walk into the grocery store, do you always know where everything is at? How much time do you spend running around trying to find something? Wouldn't you rather just take your phone, go into the store, and point it at a little Cossack when you go in, and it downloads the information from the store. And the first thing when you turn it on, it pops up and tells you all the specials. Okay? And then you type in, you know, I want ragu spaghetti sauce. It Googles it, says, and you get a little map on here that shows you exactly where it's at. And it could even show you the price. And if you wanted to be really bad, you can say, go to Kroger's because it's a better brand if you're in Walmart. Right? Now, would you like something like that? Would you like it when you go into Lowe's? I feel like grocery store and they're eventually going to be like all computerized where you can order your groceries at home. That's right. Yeah. Well, what, what if you could walk around your grocery store instead of carrying your cart, you're carrying your list and you just point your phone at the things you want to buy. Point at that, it pops up here and you say, I want three of these. And then, and then when, you, when you get ready to go, it's all delivered up to the counter, already rung up for you. There is? No. Exactly. They have a grocery store where it's just simple buttons. Right. That's right. But do you know? But is it here? There should be one coming to New York soon. Okay. But did you? How many times? Now here's a here's a very good thing. How many times have you thought something that was really neat, and then all of a sudden you find that somebody's already done it? Thought of it. Yeah, you thought of it, but some somebody else did too, right? Okay. All right, take a look at the notes.